take on this idea right now. Would you be willing to be in the right place at the right time for good things to happen? Luck will always find its way to you if you're not resisting it. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted better luck and fortune, especially during this interesting time, then do we have the Conscious Luck Show for you. Today I'll be talking with Gay Hendricks, best-selling author, transformational leader, the co-founder of the Spiritual Cinema Circle, and the co-author of a brilliant and much-needed read, along with his co-author, Carol Klein, Conscious Luck. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today about eight secrets to intentionally change your luck and your fortune. That plus we'll talk about Danny and a movie drawing. Octopuses in restaurants, Eskimos in saunas, go with the flow and cow consciousness, breaking the vapor lock, $285,000 and the IRS, Darth Vader included, moving at the speed of luck and what in the world having your book burned and banned has to do with anything. So welcome back to the show, Gay. Are you ready to shine? I am ready to shine. I'm shining like a bright new dime today. Woohoo! All right. So before we dive right into things, what do you think of the timing of your book? I I'm absolutely flabbergasted by it. I mean, given that, you know, we started the publication process a year ago, so yeah. nobody knew it was going to be coming out. And now we're in the middle of this thing that almost seems perfectly designed for a book on conscious luck. So I'm really glad so many people are getting it. And so many people are also giving it as graduation presents for people who are graduating in this strange time. And uh, I wish something I wish I'd gotten when I graduated from college. So uh, I'm really grateful for all the support we're getting. Awesome. And and it's interesting. We have a book right now that's been what I'm calling it is COVID-19 delayed as far as the release date come uh, 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 the release date is concerned. This book got pre-COVID-19 delayed, I think specifically and auspiciously, so it could come out at this time. What was the good fortune that the, brought this book about? Well, it actually started when I was 14 years old. I was in the ninth grade yeah. and it was the very first time I ever thought about luck being a conscious thing. I, I was at a movie theater. I always tell people that it took me about 60 years to get around to writing this book. But the first thought I had about conscious luck was when I was in the ninth grade and I was in a movie theater with about 250 kids who were all in there. And um, we, they said they were going to have a drawing. Yeah. And so they had us write our names down and we put 250 names in a goldfish bowl up front and they had somebody come up to draw it but before the drawing took place this kid that was sitting next to me danny nudged me in the ribs and says watch this i'm going to win the drawing and i said what and he said <laughs> yeah i always win things like this and so sure enough they had the drawing and they pulled out danny's name and he ended up winning a wristwatch which is 1959 i mean a wristwatch was a high-tech item back then and so um afterwards i asked him after the movie, I said, how did you do that? And he said, well, I just made up what my mind one day that I was going to be one of the lucky ones. Yeah. And I, he said that in his family, he'd seen by the time he was like six or eight years old, some of the people thought they were lucky and some of the people didn't. And so the good stuff always seemed to happen to the lucky ones. So he said, I think I'm going to just make up my mind in my family to be one of the lucky ones. Now, that was the first time that thought had occurred to me. And little did I know at the time that, well, almost everybody's heard of William James, who's the father of American psychology, a great Harvard professor. He said the greatest discovery of his time, which was the 19th century, was that you could alter the circumstances of your life by altering your thoughts. And so it was a time when people began to do things like creative visualization and guided meditations and things like that. Nobody had ever thought of that before. And I'd never thought of it before in the area of luck, but I decided on the spot to remake myself as a lucky person. I remember where I was standing when it happened and a little town called Leesburg, Florida. And so I uh, chose to become a lucky person and immediately had something happen that was mind-bogglingly lucky. And that was, I came out of a store and I found a briefcase on the sidewalk 
And I took it back into the store and said, I found this. Does that belong to anyway? The guy in the store jumped out of his skin and came and got it. And it turned out to belong to a a world famous coin collector, a multimillionaire coin collector who was visiting the shop that day because it was partly a coin shop. So I had this thing happen where he rewarded me with a huge coin collection that was worth more than I had ever seen before in my life. And so I uh, really got the taste of how you can change your mind and have something beautiful happen in your life right afterward as a result. Then it took me 60 years to get around to writing the book. That That's all right. The 60 years were worth it as far as our audience is concerned, because now we get the fruits of your labor and the fruits of your luck. So I want to dive into the eight secrets to intentionally change your luck. And that's what you're saying. We can intentionally change our luck. Secret number one, commit to being a VLP. Yes. And I wanted to just show you something cool with the book. The publishers, wonderful publisher, St. Martin's Press, they put inside the cover of the book the eight secrets, so you can kind of refer to them easily. And they also put them in the back of the book. So you, you can just at a glance, um, and then of course, read the book to make sure you understand them correctly. But yes, the first one is basically what I did back when I was in the ninth grade. I made a commitment to being a new kind of person. And commitment is the beginning of any kind of big successful change program. I have a friend that I play golf with uh, who has 19 years of sobriety, and he was telling me about the moment he stepped up in front of that 12-step group for the first time Mm -hmm. and said, my name's Jim, and I'm an alcoholic. And then he made a commitment to not taking a drink that day. And so it's commitment that takes this into action. I always say the longest journey anybody ever makes is the 12-inch journey from here to here, because in your heart is where you need to make a commitment. And so I invite everybody that's listening to this, I invite everybody to just make a commitment right now to being a VLP, a very lucky person. It doesn't cost you a nickel, and it's free. You can do it. We have infinite power to remake ourselves. And I know that for a fact, because I'm standing here now as a six foot tall, 180 pound person. But 50 years ago, I weighed 320 pounds. And one day I decided to remake myself and lost a hundred and some pounds in the course of a year, even though I'd struggled with childhood obesity and had treatment for thyroid problems all my life and all of that. It wasn't until I made a heart commitment to it that actually everything in my life changed. And so I really want everybody, wherever they are, to just try on that. I commit to being a very lucky person. Can't hurt you. Could make a fortune for you. Woohoo! You committed to being a very lucky person. And then you've got a career going. I think you're actually a poor grad student or just finished. And you end up having a series of lucky coincidences having to do with marshmallows and flames at some point that helped you out get into the author biz. What happened? Oh, boy, one thing after the other. But I, I, I always say, Michael, I live on a steady diet of miracles. And so one thing that happened for me was that, well, I, do you mind if I tell a few of these things in a row? Because there's like three or four things that are kind of related to please each other. Please do. Please, please do. Okay. Well, first, I have to tell you the thing that happened when I was 24, because that sets the stage for everything else. Okay. When I was 24, it was long before I met my wife. Katie and I have been together 40 years now, so this this goes back in the mists of time. I was 24 years old, and I weighed more than 300 pounds, and I smoked heavily. I smoked two or three packs of Marlboros a day. Haven't had one in my mouth now and since 1969, Um, and so I... I didn't like my job and I was in a crummy relationship that I was trying to get out of. And so basically, if I were a V8 engine, about seven of my cylinders were going pop, pop, clunk, clunk, clunk and all that. So I actually went out for a walk to kind of clear my head after an argument with the woman I lived with at the time. And it was a snowy day in New England. And I stepped on a patch of ice and my feet shot out from under me and I went whomp down on my back 
and I landed about six inches from a sharp rock. And I, I, I didn't knock myself out, but I kind of knocked myself out of myself for a minute or two minutes or something. But I realized I looked over there and I saw, wow, if I'd landed this much to the right, I might have killed myself. What am I doing with my life? And I lay there for about two minutes, just kind of, I'd say in a meditative state now. But what happened in that two minutes is I really, I think I lay still long enough to be able to feel down through all the layers of myself. And I could feel all of these emotions that I'd never touched before, like sadness and grief about my father dying and anger about being overweight and anger about being taken around to medical specialists all the time when I was a kid and all the drugs I'd been put on. Anyway, I felt all of these feelings, fear and anger and sadness. But then I came to something that was underneath all of those feelings. And it was a beautiful, big, open space of pure consciousness that didn't have any kind of programming on it. And I realized we all have that. That's our birthright. We have this infinite pool of pure consciousness that we get just as a gift of being human beings. And you can feel it right this moment. It's the part of you that's listening and paying attention to what I'm talking about and watching what I'm doing here. And so that part of ourselves is a sacred part of ourselves, but we don't honor it enough. And so I actually had the experience of it in that moment. I'd been to church when I was a kid and everything, but I never really got it. You know, I never really got God down in my body or got the spirit down in my body. I understood it, but it was this moment when I was 24 where I really felt it for the first time. And then I felt myself kind of coming back into my regular consciousness. Oh, no, I want a cigarette. Oh, no, I still weigh 300 pounds. Oh, no, I got to walk back home and go into that house again. Uh, and I felt it kind of coming back on me. But here's where the magic happened. I did this really cool thing with commitment. Yeah. I made a commitment. I said out loud to the universe, I, nobody else was there. I said, I'm going to do what it takes to maintain that feeling of pure consciousness all the time. I don't want to get it just every time I whack myself on the ground or anything. I want to feel it in my life all the time. Well, I got back, and first of all, I started eating a different way. Yeah. I started eating only foods that I hadn't eaten before. I figured, well, all of these foods I've eaten make me fat. Let me just eat things I've never eaten before. And so I started eating all these vegetables I'd never eaten before and fruits I'd eaten bef never eaten before. And so I completely changed my habits upside down. But now you want to hear some real magic I get a call from a friend of mine named Neil Marinello next day, and Neil says, hey, I'm going up the road near your house to Webster Lake, New Hampshire, to visit with one of my old Harvard professors, and would you like to come with me? And I remember saying, uh, why would I want to do that? And uh, so... I was just out of college a couple of years myself at the time, you know, hanging around professors didn't exactly light me up. <laughs> but he said, yeah, well, this professor is kind of interesting because he was my favorite psychology professor at Harvard, but he's recently gone to India and had a big awakening and he's, he's come back now and I want to hear what he has to say. And I said, okay, sounds interesting. So we go down the road to Webster Lake, and we went into this beautiful big estate on the lake, which was his father, which was uh, the professor's father's, and it turned out to be Ramdas. Of course, <laughs> he'd been Richard Alpert when he was at when he was Neil's professor, but now he was Ramdas, and he had this white robe on, and he had his beads, and he had all these young people around him, his his kind of entourage, maybe eight or ten young people that were all wearing Indian garb and uh, yoga, you know, yoga pajamas and that kind of thing. And he has his eyes and this glow about him. And he did. And he had this eight by 10 picture of this grizzled old man that he always held in his hand or had sitting next to him. And here's the thing that blew my mind, Michael. I was a teacher and a counselor at a school for delinquent boys at the time. And I taught things like psychology and 
English and stuff like that. And then I rode herd on 105 delinquent boys in, in the rest of the time, you know. So I was one of about eight teacher counselors there. And so I, I never went into a class without a stack of notes to work from. Mm -hmm. And Ram Dass sat there in this little circle, and for three hours, he would just talk. And then occasionally he would just He'd pick up the picture and look at his guru and smile, and then he'd catch a wave and he'd talk. He talked for three hours, Michael, without looking at a note or anything like that. And that to me just, where is he getting this information? I kept thinking, where's this coming from? And because the stuff he was saying was amazing. And so I went up to him afterwards and I said, look, I may never see you again. But I just got to know, where do you get this information from? Where is it coming from? And he said, oh, I think everybody has it inside. You just have to kind of find your way through yourself to listen to it. And he says, all I do is open my mouth and then say whatever comes out. And that was so radical to me. I understand it perfectly now because I've been <laughs> doing it for half my life. But at that time, it sounded just completely alien to me. And then I said something else really creative. I told him I just had this experience the day before, and I was wide open for information. And I said, just looking at me, would you have any direct suggestions for me? I may never see you again, so give me anything you got. And he kind of looked me up and down. And he said, well, you know, in India, he said, rather than doing therapy on a problem or something like that, you might go and do some yoga and breathing exercises about it. And I said, okay, where would I find something like that? And he said, oh, just pay attention. Something will come to you. And so I said, okay. <laughs> and then we broke up and I went back home and, okay, now here I am. One day I make a commitment to this thing. The next day I run into Ram Dass. Now day three, what's happening to me? <laughs> I went to the grocery store to go grocery shopping. Mm -hmm. And I was in the checkout counter. I mean, checkout stand. And I looked to my left and there on a little kiosk of paperback books was a paperback book called Yoga, Youth and Reincarnation. And it almost seemed to jump out at me. And I picked it up, and it was a whole booklet, a whole book of yoga postures, breathing exercises, meditations, everything you might want that Ram Das had told me about the day before was right there in a little book. And I remember it cost 95 cents. Wow. And what an investment, you know? And so I bought this little book, and I took it home that day. And I just started doing the processes. I started doing the yoga and then I did the breathing. And by midnight, I'd gotten to the meditation part and I started doing the meditations. And sure enough, there I was in that pure consciousness state without ever having to bang myself on the ground. And well, I'm going to I'm going to pause here because I know I've wended about three stories together, but I wanted to give you the whole background of what led up then to so many other pieces of magic in my life. It starts with commitment, and then you just have to start kind of paying attention to what's around you because once you get on the luck moonbeam, just things are coming at you all the time because luck is a wind. It's not like a lightning strike. It's a wind that's always blowing, and our job is to learn how to ride those currents. So take it from there. You 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 figured out that luck is a moonbeam that you can catch in your sails. Where did you go from there? Well, within a year, I'd lost more than 100 pounds. Interestingly enough, my eyesight actually changed during that year too, so I didn't have to wear glasses to pass my driving test the next time. My eyes somehow got better. And so I... Um, that was fantastic. I hadn't even expected that benefit. So the relationship ended up kind of falling apart as I knew it was going to eventually. And I ended up getting into Stanford for my PhD program in the most unusual way. I didn't have the grades for it or anything like that, but I had this experience being a counselor at a boarding school. And I met a professor, I mean, uh, a professor at the University of New Hampshire who had gone to the Stanford PhD program. 
And in this professor's class, I wrote a bunch of poems that had to do with the counseling process. And he sent them to one of the professors at Stanford, and a couple of them ended up getting published in counseling journals. And I ended up kind of being one of three students out of 500 that year that got in, I think purely because I, I'd written some poetry about counseling. And so I, I feel like I got a lucky break there because it's not easy to get into places like that. But I ended up having a wonderful experience there. Um, so I think, in a way, I've lived on this steady diet of miracles ever since I made that first opening investment. If I may tell you another one, my wife and I, in 1988, we were working with about maybe six or eight couples in our living room mm -hmm. in Colorado, and we had developed a way of working with relationships that was working great in our own relationship, and we started um, teaching it to others. It would eventually get into our book called Conscious Loving, but this was a couple of years before that. So one night after uh, a group, I looked at Katie and I said, look, we've got to sit down and write a book about this after the group. I said, this stuff is too valuable. We've got to put it out to more and more people. So I sat down and I, I wrote the proposal for a book and I got a contract for the book and I started working up the book and we got the book um, finished and everything like that. And just the moment it was coming out, the Persian Gulf War broke out. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't possible to get in on all the, you know, all the shows were about the war at that time, and they didn't want any self-help relationship books on it. So it kind of, it sold okay to other therapists and probably sold 40 or 50,000 copies over the course of the first year. But then after the war and the paperback was about to come out, we sat down on the floor again in front of the fireplace and just kind of visualized ourselves what we wanted to do. And a few days later, an up-and-coming young talk show host named Oprah Winfrey that we had never actually heard of at the time called and said she wanted to invite us on her show. And so we ended up going pretty much overnight from doing this with uh, six or eight couples in our living room to doing it in front of 10 million people on Oprah in uh, 1992, I guess it was. So we went from selling 5,000 books a month to selling 10,000 books an hour. Oh. That's the power of Oprah at the time. And so that sent us on a whirlwind next 10 years. My wife and I put on more than a million frequent flyer miles uh, going around the world. I think we went around the world something like 32 times during the 1990s teaching relationship seminars and body-mind seminars and that kind of thing. We were pretty much on the road uh, full time. Now, in this century, I've made a decision to uh, put on – fewer frequent flyer miles and do more of my conversations on video and through um, audio and guided meditations and things like that. What fortuitous timing. I want to dive into all, uh, the rest. We've got seven more secrets to cover, so we're going we're gonna to move a little bit quickly. However, if I understand right, it was a series of circumstances that got your book, your first book written that you hadn't even planned on going with a traditional publisher and then got your book Banned and burned, and how lucky is that? When I was at Stanford, my little girl, my then little girl, she's now 50, but uh, now uh, Amanda was then about five or six years old, and I used to go over to her classroom to help out uh, like some of the other parents did. It was that kind of school where you're kind of invited in, you know, an afternoon a week to help out in the classroom. And so in that classroom, I began to observe a lot what, what was going on. And I wrote a little book of relaxation and centering activities that the teacher could use to kind of get the kids back into it again, because I noticed that she spent half of her time, the teacher, just kind of getting people organized and getting them back in their seats and moving them from place to place. And uh, so I wrote this little book called The Centering Book, and it got picked up immediately by Prentice Hall, which was an education publisher at the time. And it came out, and it became quite a hit. I think it sold, you know, it was maybe fifty or sixty thousand, which for an education book is fantastic. But what happened was it came to the attention of one of the right-wing groups down in Texas, and I can't even remember the name of the group right now. But they were 
they put me on a list of 250 people that were called the most dangerous thinkers in America. And it was because we, uh, my little book had things like yoga in it, which they considered a real sin, and meditation, which they considered a real sin. And I'm not even sure what their beef was right now. But anyway, what happened was I got on this list of 250 dangerous thinkers, and it was incredibly flattering because on the list were people like Thomas Jefferson. Uh, John Dewey was on the list. Uh, Margaret Sanger, who was the inventor of um, Planned Parenthood and all that. So all these amazing people and that this group considered bad. So they ended up banning my book and burning my book and a couple of the other people on the list. And I'll tell you, if you want to make a book a bestseller, get your book burned. See if this new book <laughs> is coming out of your, Michael, if you can put something controversial in it oh and have somebody God. burn it because the, the, the sales took off like this right after that happened. And so I've had the pleasure many times of uh, sitting on the beach in, in Hawaii on a vacation saying, thank you for banning my book, you know? That's funny. Well, our book is is Awe, Automatic Writing Experience. It's basically how to communicate with God through your pen. Maybe that's good enough to do it. <laughs> Could very well be. So let's go from there. Let's go to secret number two. Release your personal barriers to good fortune. That's really important. Uh, many people have read my other book, The Big Leap, which is kind of the predecessor to Conscious Luck, the new book. And in The Big Leap, it's really about two big things. It's about something I call the upper limit problem, which is the tendency to sabotage ourselves when things start going better. And I lay out a whole map of that in the big leap. But basically, our upper limit problems are driven by fears we're carrying around inside. So when something starts going better, we start making more money, more accolades come in, you sell more books or whatever, suddenly these fears come up. Fears like, do I deserve it? Or am I really okay? Or is this going to be a burden? on me. Or, oh, I'm afraid if I really let myself get wealthier, for example, then other people will think ill of me. Other people in my family, it'll make them feel bad. So I laid out a number of fears inside that come up and kind of grab us when the time comes. And so we can't ever predict when that's going to happen. But in the big leap, I show how to move through those. So that's one of the type of personal barriers that we all have when things start going better and better and better in our lives. So the upper limit problem, the reason it's so important to move through those is because every upper limit problem, every problem really has the seeds of your creative greatness inside it. And so what we need to do is take a problem and instead of pushing it away or trying to pretend it doesn't exist or minimizing it, be with it, breathe with it, open up to it, open your heart to it, because that's trying to bring you a piece of wisdom. So that's why the current situation that we're moving through has a lot of fear built into it for everybody. And of course, grief too, if you know people that are sick or have died. And what we need to do, see, we're pre-wired from the factory to contract when we get scared. Evolution has given us that body that when we're scared, we clench, we hold our breath, we tighten our jaws. But here we have the opportunity to do something completely different, which is learn to expand with our fears. There may be part of us, our jaw might be contracting, but we can simply open up and move through those things and expand through them and beyond them. Because everything that comes our way is coming our way for a reason. It wouldn't be here if there was not some good reason for it. The, the thing to do is open up and be with that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And number three is transforming shame into a magnet for abundance. Yes, transforming shame into a magnet for abundance. And I'd say of all the interviews I've done so far, that's that's the secret where people say, wow, I've never heard anything like that. And I had not either. I was in my mother's house with my brother, my older brother, Mike, and we were helping clean out my mother's house after my mother passed away in 1990. And I was taking a picture frame and I was taking the picture out of it. 
And out, out of the back of it fell an envelope, and it was addressed to my mother. And it was from her church group at the Morrison Memorial Methodist Church in Leesburg, Florida. And they were saying, please, Norma, you can't just sit in your house and feel ashamed all the time. Please come back to the group. We're here for you. We love you. We're not going to judge you. My birth had been something of an inconvenience in the family. And so I can understand why my mother felt this sense of shame. But I realized, wow, if she was feeling that much shame, what must I have been feeling? Because I was inside her at the time <laughs> being gestated. And so I realized in that moment, I'd never really paid any attention to the emotion of shame. I knew about things I was sad about, and I'd gotten in touch with things I was angry about, and I'd gotten in touch with things I was scared about, but the whole idea of shame had never come into my awareness. But as I stood there, I tuned into my body, and I could actually feel it going down through my body into my legs. And it was this whole new field of feeling I could feel in myself suddenly. It was kind of like I, I was a farmer and I'd woken up one morning. I saw that I had a 40 acres of field that I didn't know I had out here. And so I had this very unusual thought in that moment. First of all, it was kind of bleh a shocker to feel that much shame in me that I'd been walking around unaware of. And, but then I realized, well, I've opened up awareness of a whole new area of my body, acres of my body, it felt like. I'm going to replant that field with something brand new. And I'm going to rededicate that field of feeling to a new crop, so to speak. And so I dedicated it to becoming an attractor field for luck and love. And so any part of my body, I said to myself, okay, I got the shame part. I see where that came from. Now I want you to simply be an attractor feel, all that new territory. I want to feel an attractor field for love and luck. And so I stood there and I kind of did my own little guided meditation on that. And in fact, I'd like to do it with uh, your group if we have time. So that was the outcome of the shame experience, was it opened up this whole new territory. Then as far as uh, number four and five, they kind of go together. The fourth secret is to have luck-worthy goals. And that means if you were really lucky, what would happen as a result of that? And give yourself big goals to get lucky for. I feel like I'm the luckiest person on earth. That's the way I want everybody else to feel. I want everybody to wake up every day feeling like the luckiest person on earth. I've been waking up every day that way, at least for the past 40 years, because that's the year I got my wife to say yes to my wedding invitation and ask her to marry me. And so I've been the luckiest man on earth. Uh, I calculated 14,500 straight days of waking up every day feeling like the luckiest man on earth because I get to be married to Katie. And Katie found you from a banned and burned book. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right, because she picked up that book at a bookstore in Palo Alto, California, and I was coming to give a lecture in Menlo Park, California, which is about a mile away. Yep. And she was the first person to sign up for the lecture because she'd bought my little book, the one that got banned. And uh, my first moment with her, I said, I'm very attracted to you. And I've just made a decision in my life that I want to only have relationships where both people are absolutely honest. Both people take responsibility for what comes up rather than blaming. And both people are really committed to their creative path because all those were all things I'd messed up on in relationships before. And so I said, I just had this realization. I said, but on those terms, would you like to come have a cup of coffee with me? <laughs> Great pickup line. What was huh? her response? I'll tell you what it was. For about 15 seconds, her eyes kind of rolled back in her head like, okay. And then she said, how about lunch instead of coffee? And that was it. Yeah. So uh, here we are 40 years later, 12 co-authored books together, 33 trips around the world and uh, having a great time doing it. I want to also talk about um, number five, because it goes along with number four. Number four has to do with getting high quality goals in your life. 
Number five has to do with take consistent action. See, what messes up a lot of people, Michael, is they take action for a couple of days and then then it kind of falls apart. What happens often, like when you start a diet, is you go very well for a couple of days and you're doing well and you've lost a few pounds. And then somebody comes along and says, hey, would you like a stick of chewing gum? And you say, "Okay," And you take the stick of chewing gum. You say, well, now that I've had that stick of chewing gum, I might as well have a 32 ounce uh, soft drink. Blum, 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 blum. Oh, well, since I've had that, I might as well have a bucket of fried chicken. So it kind of goes like that. Very, very good. So I, I want to talk about altruism for a really brief second. So under secret number four, you talk about the power of altruism. And in number five, you talk about uh, luck generating power of giving. How important is this? It's incredibly important. I think that we're giving back to the universe from the wrong direction. See, a lot of people wait until they get some money coming in Mm -hmm. and then they give some to their church or mosque or synagogue or whatever they wherever they worship. And then they give some to philanthropy, perhaps. But it's based on a something comes in and I give part of it. Let me tell you a different way to do it. Go out front, give first and then let yourself be rewarded infinitely as a result. And here's why. Because if you have a farmer, my wife is a great gardener. We have these beautiful grounds around our house and she works with the gardeners to make them really gorgeous. And that's one of the many millions of things she does really well. Gardeners, farmers, they go out and they plant seeds and then they water and tend the seeds and they put fertilizer on them. They're giving first, and then they let the reward come back in abundance. No farmer will ever go out in the field and say, okay, give me some vegetables, and if I like them, I'll give you some water. You know, it just doesn't work that way. The gardener doesn't say, okay, give me some flowers, and then maybe I'll water you if I like what I see. You've got to make that initial investment first. You've got to get out in front. I call it getting out in front of your heart, you know, getting out front of yourself to give and then let it be okay to be rewarded. The reason that's important is because it's physiologically consonant with how our bodies go. We can consciously take a big breath out and then that invites a big breath in. If you try to do it the other way around though, it doesn't work as well because you have to effort then to take a big breath in. So start with the out breath. Give as much as you can and then let as much as you can come back in. It's more harmonious with the nature, the way nature is actually put together. I like it because you're giving room for something to come in. And speaking of giving room, next is secret number six, find your lucky tribe. And you said that you need to be able to look on the outside of the box. We're not in this alone. We need to think of ourselves in a community, in a family, in a world that any act you do of your own personal development has an immediate effect on the people around you. And I really advocate people choosing to be around people that are smarter than you are, people that are luckier than you are. I want you to find people that you can grow into, if at all possible. So a lot of us get kind of dragged down by hanging around people that have a hard luck story about their lives, and that transfer transfers over to us. And so I really recommend that people find their lucky tribe. Go out first and find three to five people whose faces light up when you walk in the room. And you just keep looking until you find those three to five people. And three to five people who make your face light up when they walk in the room. Because the instructions for how to get out of the box are written on the outside of the box. You need help. And we all need help. We all need to reach out and say, I'd like to move forward. Can anybody give me an insight into how better to do that? You know, open your heart to what's trying to come in from all around us. You say that you really want to try something new and say yes to it. What's the importance of that? It's because, like I I was saying, that the longest journey is from head to heart. And what you have to do is have idea, a new idea in your mind, but then you have to let it settle into the rest of your body. Because you don't want to have to keep thinking of it all the time. You want it to be part of the background experience of your life. 
So let's say you're trying to manifest a new house or a, a new red Ferrari. You don't want to go around obsessively pestering the universe. I want a new Ferrari. I want a new Ferrari. Want... Open up and embody that goal. Feel it down, down deep in yourself. Feel it down deep so that you know how uh, after you've learned to ride a bicycle, you can not do it for a while, but then step back onto it and you can get right back into it or driving a car, anything like that, that you feel that's kind of embodied down in the being of your body. Well, that's how I want you to feel your luck working. You don't even have to think about it. You embody it at such a deep level that it gets there before you do. Thank you. Thank you. Then let's go to secret number seven. Learn to be at the right place at the right time. And I want to talk about that. And I'm really curious about operating at the speed of luck. Yes. Well, I was saying earlier, I got this idea from a woman who's a Stanford professor named Tina Selig. She does research on conscious luck and did a uh, TED talk on it and everything. Uh, but we didn't discover her until we started doing interviews for the book. And I'm glad we did because she gave us the absolute perfect metaphor for how luck actually works. She says most people think of luck as something you're born with or maybe like lightning striking, like winning a lottery. But she says that it's more like a wind that's blowing all the time and we need to learn how to open our sails to it so that we can move around and let it take us to the right place at the right time. If you think about it, the wind is always at the right place at the right time. It's where it is. And you can either resist that and say, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to be part of this. Or you can go with it until it takes you to where it needs to go. When I was a kid growing up in Florida, there was a with the big springs nearby. and We always used to take inner tubes there and we would start at the top end of the sw springs and it would take us down through all these rapids and around these big rocks and everything to the bottom. And it was such a way that you never got hurt by banging into the rocks or anything like that. But the water would always find its way around the rocks. And so in the same sort of way, luck will always find its way to you if you're not resisting it. And so we recommend in the book a number of ways to kind of get into harmony with being in the right place at the right time. But even before you read the book, just take on this idea right now. Would you be willing to be in the right place at the right time for good things to happen? Would you be willing just to open the willingness to always be at the right place at the right time for the best possible thing to happen? Thank you. You, you share a brief story in the book about uh, rushing to get to uh, a from one flight to another flight and you were, I think, forcing your way, and then you actually got into your essence pace. You got into this sweet stride where you weren't forcing the outcome. Person in yeah. front of you there at the counter has a meltdown, forces the outcome, doesn't go so well. You instead were willing, and you got into that space, and what happened? Yes, yeah, one of those moments where I was rushing to catch an airplane at the da Dallas Fort Worth airport, which is huge and you have to take a train around and everything. And my plane was at the other end of the airport from my new plane and I'd gotten there an hour late. So I'm madly scrambling down the concourse, pulling my wheelies behind me and, you know, kind of upset. And, blah, blah. and I saw on the uh, screen that, oh, the flight was boarded. And so I, Mm, I caught myself. I was really in a hurry. And so I just slowed down and I breathed and I said, okay, huh, I'm just going to move at the speed, my own essence pace. And so I continued walking on down, caught the train, rode around. So I come up the concourse and there at the podium, the clerk is enduring a meltdown from this guy who's pounding on the podium. And I come up and I, and he's saying, my name is Humphrey T. Snowden III, and you cannot treat me like this. I have a ticket to go and on first class, and I'm going to sue you if you don't put me on board. And she's saying, I'm sorry, sir, the gate closed. We had to go without you, your plane, et cetera. And he's continuing to throw his temper tantrum. So I just came up and just kind of <sighs> took a breath. And he stalked on off up the concourse, shaking his fist. 
And so I just stepped up into the place and I took a breath and I said, something like tough day, huh? And the, the clerk said, oh, you wouldn't believe it, you know. And just then, one of the flight attendant attendants opened the jetway door and came rushing up to the podium. And they had this little whispered conversation. And the woman turned to me and said, we miscounted. We've got one seat left in first class. Would you like it? And I said, yes, I would. Oh, and the other thing was, she kind of looked up the concourse at where this guy was walking up about 100 feet away. And I saw her kind of go, eh, you know. <laughs> so I went from zero to 60. You know, there I was in one moment, no possibility of getting on the plane. And then I kind of got into the moment and poof, something opened up. Now I see that almost as a principle. It's the way things work. So, you know, like sometimes I'll get caught in a traffic jam in L.A. trying to get to an appointment or something. And I used to get upset about it when I first moved to California 25 years ago. But if you get upset about it, you don't last long out here. And so now I just take a breath and I say, OK, I'm in a Zen monastery right now. I'm sitting. I'm doing a sitting meditation. Sure, I'm sitting in a car with 300,000 other cars around me and we're not moving anywhere. <sighs> but I'm in a Zen monastery called L.A. Traffic. So when I do that, when I remember to do that, traffic begins to move again. I, I've, been, I've been in my nice, it was a gold rental convertible just outside of LAX, watching as I'm pretty sure my plane flew overhead, which <laughs> gave me time to go back to the Malibu beach because I had to get things rebooked and stuff. How does it get any better than this? It, That's right. It brings us to secret number eight, practice radical gratitude and appreciation. Yes, I just had a memory, interestingly enough, of something I haven't thought about in years. Yeah. My wife and I, one time, Katie and I went once went to Fiji. Someone hired us to do a, a retreat for a whole bunch of couples out there. So we, we flew all the way to Fiji and there was probably 50 people that we we're going to be meeting with. <laughs> but as we literally, as we were coming in from the airport, they had a, a military coup in Fiji oh my. and, you know, made all the papers and everything like that. But so we're going into the place and there's suddenly there's soldiers everywhere with guns. And so Katie and I said, well, what should we do? And we decided, well, we're going to go ahead with our retreat and just pretend that the coup never happened. It's none of our business. If they want to change governments, it's none of my business. But let's just make a deal. We're not going to be inconvenienced by this in any way. And it's interesting. We weren't. We went on about our business. We had our meeting with 50 people. We met for seven days. During the seven days, they kind of worked out the coup and they the soldiers disappeared and everything like that. But radical gratitude is being appreciative for whatever the circumstances you are, you know, because we could have gotten upset about it. And, you know, um, but what's already happened is what's already happened. You don't have any control over it. And if you spend your time going, oh, I'm not going to be treated like this, oh, I'm the victim here. Yeah, not only do you have a bad time in life, but it puts you out of the moment where good things happen, like that moment where I got my first class seat. Ah, you know, that came from a letting go, not a striving. And so that's oftentimes most of us know how to strive, but most of us don't know very much how to ease up and let go and make a space for magic to happen. Well, that, that gets to the word we, and, and when we go to those invisible barriers that you were talking about earlier, that we may have a barrier to receiving. Well, I think that is something that is worth really underlining here, Michael, because one of the main ideas behind conscious luck is the idea that we need to work on our receptor apparatus, not our expressor apparatus. You know, you know how to write a book. You know how to put something together. You know how to do a radio show. But what most of us need to do is work on openness to receiving more. And in fact, that's the next big thing I'm going to be working on um, in my next big seminar is focusing exclusively on that particular aspect of life. Because no matter if you're a first grader or the CEO of a 
Fortune 50 company, I can guarantee you that you're not open as fully as you could be to receiving the good things that would make your life rich. There's a, a monk who we had on the show years ago. He has a famous Google talk. A monk, his name is Ajahn Brahm. And somebody would compliment him. And instead of going, oh, no, no, he would go, thank you. I deserve that. Yes. I had, uh, I had one time, I don't remember if I told this story in the book, but um, I had a, a well-known person call me up when we had our beach house over in uh, Carpinteria. And he said, that he was having an anxiety attack. He, and I said, well, what's going on? And he said, tomorrow I have to go down to Hollywood and have my palm prints put in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, you know, there with all the other stars. And I said, oh, you have to do that, huh? And um, he said, yeah, yeah. And so he was freaking out about it. So I had him come over to the house. I said, come on, drive on over. And so um, he lived just up the road. And so he came over and we stood on the balcony of our place looking out over the Pacific Ocean there. And I went inside and I happened to have a stack of quarters mm -hmm. on the counter because we used them when we went to the farmer's market. A lot of the farmers appreciated if you took change with you, you know. And so we always took a whole bunch of quarters um, so they didn't have to give away all their one dollar bills and that kind of thing. So. I picked up a handful of quarters and I brought them back out on the uh, steps or on the balcony. And I said, here, put out your hand. And he said, okay. And so he put out his hand and I dropped a quarter into it. And I said, there, that's yours. And he said, no, huh? And looked at me and then I dropped another quarter. And I said, there, there's another one. That's all yours. And he said, huh? Okay. And looked at me like, what the hell are you doing? I said, plink, there's another one. That's all yours. Anyway, I got up to about $1.75 before he got the message. All of a sudden he said, oh, thank you. <sighs> because instead of just saying thank you for the gift of this moment, he was making up all these stories. and What the heck is this all about? What does this have to do with anything? It's like John Lennon says, life is what's going on while you're busy making other plans. Amen. You know? Couple last questions that we'll dive into a really brief meditation. This has been so much fun, Gay. Is there a difference between feeling lucky and being lucky? Oh, yeah. A lot of people can be lucky without feeling lucky. I've actually... This will blow your mind. I've actually been in an office like this one <laughs> with people who were worth between them, a husband and wife, who were between one and three hundred million dollars, who were fighting about the price of peanut butter. He's upset because she buys the one from the health food store that's seven dollars and forty nine cents. Whereas the one at the supermarket for $3.99 is just as good, you know. They get in the same argument about she likes to buy the super great ecological toilet paper and he thinks she'd buy the one that costs $1.99 for three rolls. Anyway, they get in the fights over these terribly ridiculous little things and don't realize, oh, wait a minute, we've got enough money to buy a roll of toilet paper for everybody on earth. You know, you get busy fighting about the forest and you realize, don't realize you own the forest. So we need to get good at expanding our awareness of ourselves. Beautiful. So before we dive into a really brief, I think it's called a tractor field for luck and love meditation. Any last words of wisdom, Gay? Well, here at the Hendricks Institute, we teach a lot of seminars. And when you get through one of our seminars, we give you a little wristband. And on the wristband, it says, breathe, move, love. And what we mean by that is anytime you've got a problem or you feel stuck, first of all, go to the basics. Take a few breaths. <sighs> move your body around a little bit. Get out of your usual habitual way of being for a moment. And then love as much as you can from wherever you are. We're never asked to do any more than that in life. 
And so if you're feeling stuck and hateful, love yourself for feeling stuck and hateful. If you're feeling totally unlovable, love yourself for feeling unlovable. There is no power love can't unlock. And so breathe, move, love are three things that you can always remember to do from wherever you are. Woohoo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. Would you mind leading us in a short then attractor field for luck and love meditation? Good. I'll give you a miniature version of the long one that you can download at ConsciousLuck.com. Perfect. And this one you can uh, take with you anywhere. So first of all, get your body centered. Take a few easy breaths. Move your body around a little bit. Stretch any kinks out. Mm, take a few breaths. And then take a moment to open up a field of love inside yourself. Think of someone you know for absolute sure you love. They might be a living person, or they might be a person who's passed on. But just think of someone you absolutely know for sure you love. And think of a person, could be a different person, could be the same person. Think of a person whose love really changed your life. I'm thinking of my grandmother at this moment. Her love changed my life. For you, feel the love that changed your life, wherever it came from. And then take a moment to give yourself that kind of love. Feel that kind of love for you. And from that field of love, I'd like to ask you a question. Would you be willing to become the luckiest person you know? Just take that question on and resonate with that. There are no right or wrong answers. This might be the day when you can say yes to that. This might be the day when it's not quite right to say yes. But if you feel like you'd be willing to become the luckiest person you know, say yes to that. And feel that yes in your body. Just feel that whole body yes. Now take it one step further. Would you be willing to make a commitment to that? And if you would be, make a commitment to that. Just say something simple in your mind like, I commit to being the luckiest person I know. And feel that commitment down in your body. Feel it. I commit to being the luckiest person I know. Of course, you don't know how that's going to happen. None of us do. That's part of the great mystery. But just opening your heart to it, saying yes to it, begins to open up an attractor field in yourself. Before we complete this, take another moment to love and accept yourself for everything you are and everything you are not. I accept myself, say to yourself, for everything I am and everything I'm not. I accept it just like it is. And I love it just like it is. Let yourself love as much as you can from wherever you are. And then take a few easy breaths, move your body around a little bit and open up your eyes if they've been closed. <sighs> this has been so beautiful, Gay. Thank you. So where can people go to find Conscious Luck and find out more? Go to ConsciousLuck.com. ConsciousLuck.com has a couple of cool things. First, you can buy the book there from all the different book dealers, yep. Amazon and so forth. But you can also download two three-minute meditations that go along with the book. Uh, I highly recommend that you listen to the morning meditation and the evening meditation every day or even just once a week because they will put into practice a lot of the things that are 
right there in the book. But some of us learn better and faster through things we hear as well as things we read. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get conscious luck, and begin intentionally changing your luck and good fortune today and shine bright. Woohoo! You outdid yourself, Gay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Appreciate the opportunity, Michael. If you're watching this, then you are a light worker. You're a light warrior, and I want to help. We offer everything from boot camps, mini masterclasses, full on masterminds, and private one on one coaching with me. To find out more about our upcoming courses, simply visit InspireNationUniversity.com or click on the links below. And to find out more about coaching, simply visit InspireNationUniversity.com backslash coaching. We also have weekly YouTube live events with me where you can ask me your questions live and YouTube premieres featuring me and our guests. Simply subscribe below and click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows. I just had the most beautiful, get lucky, luck filled, bring more luck and good fortune into your life interview with Gay Hendricks on Conscious Luck. To check out more luck filled interviews, click here, subscribe below, click on that bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows, YouTube lives with me and premieres. Be sure to join us at the boot camps. Click the link below to join us at the boot camps and above and beyond all else, shine bright.